downstairs. We had, they had to move downstairs into the southwest corner bedroom, which was a room that couldn't be used in winter. Anyway, it was a crazy house. And I quickly realised that it could be, well, I hoped it could be massively improved. And I actually watched an episode of Carbon Cops back in 2007. Some of you will remember. Um, Lish Fayer was a presenter of Carbon Cops and a good friend of mine. And I saw a blower door used for the first time and I thought, that's what I need. This house I've bought is leaky and I need someone to do a blower door test and then I'll be able to seal up the drafts and that will make a big difference. So the next day I went looking for someone to do a blower door test and realised that the blower door used in a carbon cock sh show was the only blower door being used in residential construction in Australia. And it was down in Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that then led me to thermal imaging. Um, and again, I realised no one was thermal imaging in the residential space either, and there was clearly great potential to team those two things up. So, long story short, I left a um, job in the Department of Innovation working uh, uh, in policy um, to actually go out and be innovative. So this house is the current case study in the Your Home Guide, the Federal Government's Your Home Guide, um, which is about to be updated and my new house is about to become the, the new OCG case study. Mm -hmm. well, I can talk more about that, but I learned a lot. We achieved incredible improvements in this house. So that was the first test, um, uh, proving to myself that this stuff can really work. Uh, so I mentioned a blower door. Um, and the thermal imaging. I also trained, like probably a few years, certainly Peter is, trained as um, an EER, or an energy rater. Um, so doing thermal performance modelling. And I think the thermal performance modelling tool, the EER rating tool, is actually incredibly powerful. It's grossly misunderstood and um, underutilised in Australian, um, the Australian housing industry. So it's a tool that I employ with every project. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about that. The blower door, the thermal camera. My current house, I'm not going to talk about that tonight because that's not a retrofit, that is a new build. I should point out the lighthouse that over half of our work now is renovation work. Um, and so that's when I talk about our work, the, the major architectural and science integrated approach, um, the sort of more bigger budget projects. In addition to that work, we do a lot of small-scale retrofit advisory work. Um, and I'll be talking about one of those case studies first, a, a really small budget retrofit, and then uh, a project where we've actually redesigned, uh, so there's quite an integrated architectural approach as well as the science, but a smaller budget than is typical. So the first case study is one um, not far from here at all, in Turner. It's an old... Um, Oh, I can't remember what it was built, but it's one of the really old double brick, red double brick cottages um, very close to ANU. And the clients have lived in it for 29 years. They extended it 15 or 20 years ago. I'll show you a floor plan in a minute. But they have suffered again through um, hot summers and cold winters and had reached the conclusion that the only way for them to be comfortable as they move toward retirement was to actually build a secondary residence in their backyard. So that's the mindset they came to us with. So we initially did a feasibility study, really looking at a secondary residence, but I said, well, if we're going to do this, let's have a look at the existing house too, because I think you might be surprised what we can achieve with the existing house. So um, let's have a quick look at this story. It's mainly pictures. So this is the block. Um, they're lucky, the long, relatively long axis of the house has got slightly northeasterly orientation. So this is the street frontage, which is slightly south of west. Classic old cottage. But it had been extended out the back. So that is, oh, well, you can see north up there. That new living space does have really nice northerly access. But you'll see it also has masses of glazing. So a very large glazing to floor area, area ratio, which is one of my passions I've been born with. So the original cottage, double, um, double brick, the extension was a brick veneer. They had double glaze, the extension, and retrofitted some double glazing uh, to the sitting area and study, or the front room, or the two front rooms, the back one. But it was still extremely uncomfortable. So we humoured them. We wasn't humouring them at this stage. We investigated the options. Um, they did have this lovely space at the back, complicated with an easement and a bit of an angle. But we worked out we could do a really clever small spire house at the back, and we've done quite a few of those. 
Um, so we investigated that, I won't go into the details of that, and we explained to them how much that would cost and the planning um, rules that they would have to comply with. So that was something they could have done. But at the same time, I said, let's just, oh, well first of all, clearly the site had potential for an eight star house. Um, to put things into perspective, I'm not sure if everyone here realises that an eight-star house requires half as much energy um, to heat and cool, or over a year, as a six-star house in our climate. So it's not linear. Um, it's a massive improvement from six to eight stars. Clearly we could do an eight-star... Oh, and I should point out, and that there are houses that rated around eight stars. In, if you take them up to Sydney or Brisbane, they're about nine and a half stars. So we've got a really harsh climate here that we have to work with. Anyway. So we could do that, that's no problem, but I wanted them to think about what they could do to the existing house. So thermal modelling of the existing house showed that with the improvements they had made, they would topped up the ceiling insulation, they had put in some double glazing, and they had that thermal mass in the double brick, although it was uninsulated. The house was actually rating at 3.9 stars, um, but I knew we could improve that. Sorry about these slides, the boys. The thing to really note here is that we could take it from 3.9 star to 5.9 star. And the things that we focused on were insulating those double brick walls, ensuring all the ceilings were thoroughly insulated, um, some thorough draft ceiling, and reducing the amounts of glazing in that extension out the back, just slightly. Um, and adding helmets to the existing curtains in a really simple stuff. So doing that, um, left um, a unit. There was a huge improvement. Um, what's that in terms of percentage? Then? It's not half. It's about a, what, 80% reduction? Mm. So there's the modelling. Um, as part of this, as I said, we upgraded the insulation levels, but I've also manipulated or optimised the glazing to the existing extension. People tend to think that when existing glazing is there, you can't do anything about it. You can. You can reduce glazing levels. Um, we do it a lot. Um, but again, we use this tool to really inform clients about when they're going to get good bang for buck. I think that was something else I wanted to do. Yeah, we'll come back to you. I'll ask the question. Um, oh, just like they did most of their living in that extension out the back. So if we looked at that, keeping in mind it was an extension that was only done about 15 years ago, it was insulated and double glazed, it was performing at five and a half stars. Um, that zone alone was performing at five and a half stars. With the suggested changes um, that we proposed, it was up to 7.5 stars. So that was a, a halving in the energy use for that space. So we did that feasibility study and I tempted them by saying, look, I think there's enormous potential in your existing house. Um, I think you'd be a bit crazy to throw heaps of money into building a secondary residence when your existing house could potentially be transformed with a much, much smaller budget. They were really, really sceptical, but they realised that they'd be silly not to give it a go. So as part of that, we came in with the blower door, excuse me, and the thermal camera to thoroughly check out the building and the like. I already had my suspicions about the, the draft issues. So, Obviously, you can't read this, but this shows you the output from a blower door test. Um, the important thing in this is that the number of air changes per hour of this house was 17.6, which is actually not bad for a Canberra home. Obviously, it could be a lot better. So that's 17.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals, which is the test pressure. To put that in perspective, um, passive house standard aims for 0.6 air changes per hour. In our new builds and most of our renovations now, we get between three and six air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And there's almost a linear relationship between air leakage um, and energy consumption over winter in Canberra. I've been able to show that in several projects. Anyway, so it's pretty leaky, no surprises. We then located those leaks with the help of the thermal camera. Their beautiful new timber double glazing in the extension leaked like a sieve, as did their skirtings, as did the down lights, all the classic things you see. Um, and in the existing house, we also found some interesting spots inside cupboards and, and other things. You know, often there are some hidden, quite significant hidden holes. And some permanent vents, which are classic in these old houses. We also looked at the insulation and we found some significant gaps. 
as I'm sure this audience is aware, it only takes 5% um, gaps in your R5 ceiling insulation to reduce its effectiveness by half. So if you're going to pay for that R5 insulation, you really want it to be thorough to do its job well. So um, then we looked again in more detail. They wanted to investigate, okay, let's really check out the glazing levels in this new, we call the new area, the old extension out the back. Um, what really would be the optimal glazing sizes? So we looked at reducing, I can't remember the percentage reduction now, but basically this, this window used to go all the way, pretty much to the corner, a bit further out here. I reduced it probably by 1,500 in width. They were full height. And then they were, these ones out to the west were also full height. Um, and about 2.73 metres wide. So we reduced those, so we still have that view out to the west, but reduced them to about 1,200 high um, and reduced the width slightly. Um, so this was, these were proposed changes. Um, <coughs> Jenny, did you keep it at double glazing or what did you think of triple glazing? No, um, I'm not a fan of triple glazing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, if you optimise the glazing to floor area ratio in our climate and you really make good use of the sun, so really good solar passive design, um, then triple glazing, the bang for buck just isn't there, in my experience. If you're going to design a house that's got spectacular views to the southwest and have an enormous amount of glass for some other reason, then thermally it may make sense. It'll still cost you a bomb, but thermally it may make sense. But not the way we design. But you could easily incorporate that into a scenario with your model. Yes, absolutely, and we do that. So with my own home, for example, I have done that, and there was absolutely no benefit. It was neutral, whereas the cost would have gone up. And what about awnings instead of reducing the window? Like awnings well, awn awnings are only about preventing sun strike. You've still yeah. got the conductive losses and gains, so um, that can only do so much. Yeah, so you so have what to is the ratio of floor to glazing? So where is that sweet spot? Oh, it totally depends on the orientation. So there's no crude rule of thumb, although I will then say that with most of our houses, um, the living areas are around 30 to 35 percent. So our, our houses actually tend to have lower levels of glazing compared to new, certainly architect designed homes. They don't feel less light, they don't function less well, but they have less glass. It's just really carefully positioned to connect to the outdoors and to get the sun and the views. So be really careful. Just because the wall faces north doesn't mean it should all be glass. You can go way too far in the kind of climate. Um, and then relying on triple glazing to compensate for that is quite dangerous because triple glazing still won't perform as well as an insulated wall. Ne it won't perform nearly as well as an insulated wall. Okay, uh, I sh uh, pop this image in to show you an example. This is not the house I'm talking about in Turner, but this is another project in Rivet that we finished last year. This is um, to the southeast, this corner. Yes. No, southwest. What am I saying? Southwest. Um, and we have reduced the glazing. We've opened up to the north and the east um, and uh, improved the connection to the backyard, but reduced the glazing to the south and west. All right. Right. South and east. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. South and east. Um, Not much sun on the south. No. Sorry. There wouldn't be much sun on the south. No, side. but plenty of heat loss. Um, but just, that's just to show you that you can be done neatly. You can make um, reductions in window size look kind of neat. But I'm not here pretending to be an architect. I'm, I'm doing the science stuff. Apologies for the ugly wordy slide, but this is an excerpt from an email that the clients from that Turner House sent me unprompted on the 6th of January and it made my day. And like all of you, we were suffering severely from the old Summergeddon. Um, you can all read that, I presume. What, do you need me to read it out? Yeah. But they were stoked. It's actually much longer than that. I've got the whole thing here if you want to read it. Um, so they went from being sceptical clients to, oh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, and they were amazed. Um, and their home actually became sort of the haven that their other friends would come to during the, the uh, peak of the extreme heat and smoke. Um, so they spent, uh, what, 11, just over $11,000, I think, to date. So they haven't done the window changes yet. And then I've added in what we charge for our services. So for about $16,000, they've massively transformed their home in a way that they couldn't 
have imagined and they no longer want to build another house in the backyard. So they've saved themselves quite a lot of money. Um, and all existing, <coughs> nearly all, um, most Canberra homes have huge potential. These double brick ones with good orientation have particularly good potential. But you can improve even a poorly oriented brick veneer um, home significantly. So I encourage you all not to give up on existing houses. Any questions about that case study before I move on? So the blower door test only gave you sort of a number as to how how it actually performs. It wasn't, and it would, and you had to use the thermal imaging to actually identify where those leaks were. You don't have to have a thermal camera to find air leaks, but we use it as a visual mm -hmm. and aid to help communicate to clients. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a blower door only um, quantifies. It doesn't locate exactly. the that's the, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so you have to go around and do that separately. Mm -hmm. So, so, you've got so your 17 number yes. was prior to doing any work? Yeah, I haven't been back to test it. So, okay. yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> Just too busy. But, you know, and it was only in January they contacted me. And we actually had lots of people wanting to do air leakage testing while it was really smoky. And I had to explain to people, you don't want me to come and do no. pressurising <laughs> while well, it's really smoky. Let's wait until the smoke goes away. Um, and so now the blower door is being used quite a lot. But yeah, it would be great. I would make sure we drop back um, and check it out. Wasn't it once uh, oh, a health consideration to have lots of insulation? And they used to have the vents up in the... Modern houses don't have it, but all the houses I, I'm involved in do. The, the permanent the, vents. The little permanent vents. Yeah, it was all about moisture management, the belief that we, we had to look. The way we construct now um, and insulate and design for good ventilation. So air tightness, whenever I talk about air tightness, you, you must know that at the same time we're thinking about ventilation. Um, so you shouldn't be thinking about one without the other. So ventilation is the ability simply to open windows but as well to having good exhaust fans in your bathrooms and your kitchens. And if you get really airtight, having heat recovery ventilation systems. Um, so in our, in our climate, get rid of the permanent vents, but you do want to have, take a holistic approach to the house. I've got an article in Renew from last year which talks about condensation management, which stresses how all those things interact, insulation, air tightness, ventilation, condensation, moisture management, all have to be thought of together. It's quite important, but it's not impossible. It's, it's quite easy to do. Yeah. Okay. Is window film survival alternative to retrofitting and double glazing? Um, they're nowhere near as good, um, and get really mixed reviews. I have never. I my approach is um, save up for double glazing when it makes sense. I, we don't always double glaze in um, retrofit projects, I should say. It doesn't necessarily stack up financially. So these guys haven't, and they may not. It'll be interesting. Sorry, they already had double glazing. They haven't reduced their glazing. But in a lot of our retrofit projects, people don't necessarily double glaze because there are much cheaper options. Um, improving your window dressings, putting in a pelmet, which could be a piece of cardboard. It doesn't have to be expensive things from... Um, you know, curtain and blind shops. Um, or using bubble wrap, you know, um, a lot of renters, I work with a lot of renters to help them stay comfortable in houses. So, um, the films, I just seem to get really mixed reviews and about their hardiness. Have you had experience with them? No, um, no. I had a film fit for, for a different reason and people were like fitting it, but spooking the idea of putting a 3 d film on to upgrade the, the performance of the window to close to double glazed. Yeah. Um, Obviously it's a lot cheaper. Yes, it is a lot cheaper. Um, again, that's the sort of thing you can test in the, in the modelling to see what sort of, how much thermal bang for buck is it actually going to give you. Um, but I would be stressing it <coughs> externally shown first. Sorry, I'm struggling to see where the questions are coming from. The modelling software yes. and the star rating, what were they please? Um, what, uh, I, I use Burr's Pro, okay. so there are three different interfaces on top of the one engine that's developed and maintained by CSIRO um, and the rating of this is you're asking the rating of this house Was it or they are the same thing okay. yeah okay. yeah so Natas and EER there are there are three different softwares that are used in the Natas EER world 
One's called Burr's Pro, one's called First Rate, and the other one's called Accurate. And they're just different interfaces that use the same engine. And I use Burr's Pro, but yeah, Natto Z and then are the same thing. Okay, so we can come back to this case study, that, uh, the Turner case study if you like. I thought I'd break things up before I go into the, the next um, case study <coughs> of ours. To point out that a few years ago, I did some case study work with the ACT government with low income housing. And this again is to stress that with really small budgets, you can have significant impacts. You can download this um, online. It's a little bit hard to find on the ACT government site. I've got a link from our website. And again, apologies for all the words, but the key results were that we achieved a 22% reduction in energy use in the winter quarter. Most of these projects had a budget between $500 and $5,000. And we achieved significant improvements. Um, and again and again and again, it was the simple draft ceiling that was most cost effective. So it doesn't matter um, what you do. You and a corking gun in a house, I assure you, you will get good bang for buck. Mm -hmm. And Renew did a, was it Renew or, yeah, Renew did a fantastic um, article on all the draft ceiling, um, all the corking agents um, and draft ceiling options just last year, which I often refer people to. Um, okay, so that's my little break. Uh, oh, and there's lots of stuff on our website too that we put for free. And I won't carry on about Windows too much, but I do have three window blogs, which I encourage you all to read if you want to get across some basics of Windows. Um, and our website is now searchable, so you type in Windows, you'll get the three blogs. Um, okay. Oh, and My Efficient Electric Home, another plug. Um, and people here, members of My Efficient Electric Home, here quite a few of you. So it's a free Facebook group. I came on as a volunteer admin a year and a half or so ago. We're now at over 12,000 members. It's where people share um, information and advice um, about retrofitting your houses or new houses, um, how to optimise their energy efficiency and go all electric. There's a real mix. There's a lot of people who are passionate but not experts, and there's quite a few experts. Um, so you have to sift through, but it is searchable. So it's quite an amazing database um, of information. Um, and I, I actually use it quite a lot. Um, so. <coughs> okay, the next case study is a project called Fabode House, not just because it's a fabulous abode. The fab is actually to do with their surname, um, is Fabio. Um, this was a project in, or is a project, in Kayleen, and we are really proud of this one. We had it open for Solar House Day last year, and we are most proud of it because it was a 115 square metre house to start with, and it was a 115 square metre house when we finished with it. Um, and this family had been harangued, by um, their extended family to, why don't you just knock it down, it's diabolical, and it isn't, it's horrible. It did need a lot of maintenance, it wasn't in great condition, but it had really good potential. And they were very interested in um, taking a more sustainable approach. So, um, oh, there it is. So, in the corner site, you can see north, this is north, it's directly up. North is through the corner of the house, so the front of the house faces northeast. Um, so a little 1970s um, rectangular house in Cayman. These are some before shots. Um, classic little house, hadn't had much love and attention. Um, the floor plan was very strange. I do have a floor plan coming up, but the rooms you can see through to the kitchen from a dining space. Um, and then the dining space was completely cut off from the living space, which, which was actually across the hallway from the entryway. And all the rooms were very, very separate. And um, they didn't flow or work very well at all. The old kitchen, the original kitchen, and then um, one of the kids' bedrooms. So we were determined to take a smaller, smarter, sustainable approach. I was saying um, to some people earlier that we've now switched our language a bit. And we now say clever, comfortable, and climate resilient because this summer Geddon has tipped a heap of extra people over the edge. The people who aren't necessarily concerned with, about sustainability or energy efficiency um, so much, uh, but they want to be comfortable, they want to be healthy, and they're concerned about what the future climate 
this is going to be like. So this might be our old bear trap. Uh, I've actually got a bigger floor plan. Here we go. So beforehand, as I said, the rooms were all very separate. Um, I don't know if you can read it. I've actually got the star ratings of the rooms um, up there. <coughs> One of the beautiful things about the EER tool is that it not only gives you a rating for the overall house, but it lets you look at the performance of each zone. Mm -hmm. So you can really use it to kind of optimise each space in the house. So for example, the living space before was at 3.4 stars. When we finished, it's, it's at 7.2 stars. The bedroom back here, is at seven stars, the bedroom up here was at 3.9 stars. Um, so we opened it up, the living space has opened up more to that northeast, a little bit to the northwest, and we still maintain some connection um, out to the southwest to give them the connection to their backyard. That's that's amazing in the sense that you seem to have relocated all of the surfaces yeah. as well. Yes, that sorry, I, I, think I forgot to point that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoops. <coughs> How did you manage that? It's easy. Really? Yeah, uh, on a, it is. <laughs> you know, these days, plug, it, moving services is not hard, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on a suspended timber floor. It's really not. What about doesn't on slabs, though? Yeah, yeah, different story. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, very different story. So, suspended timber, you've got a lot of opportunity. What was the budget on this? This ended up being 276. They got a new roof, uh, a new 7. Point, no, actually 6.8. They didn't do the subfloor insulation. They chose to leave that out for now. 6.8 star from 3. Point, I'll tell you on the next slide, I think. Um, that's got one, two, three slash four bedrooms. So that multi-purpose room is designed to close down nicely as an alternative for the guest bedroom. Also as a sort of snug TV room or music room. They got two bathrooms. They've got an ensuite and a bathroom. Cleverly tucked the laundry into the hallway. Um, so they got a lot more, which I think I've got on the next slide. So, yeah, from three bedroom, one bath, to three bed, plus a multi-purpose room, two bathrooms, and a study nook. This fantastic um, study nook, which you've seen some images here. So, the two girls, they've got two girls in one in primary and one in high school. Uh, study space here that they all share. And it works really well. I, I was just going to say, um, 3.6 is actually not a bad starting point for a house in Kayleen. Mm -hmm. No, it would. Um, <laughs> Very few go up for sale. Like, like, You've got to, uh, so stars. this is... This is an important diff uh, thing to point out too. So the energy efficiency ratings you see in the newspaper for when houses are sold use what we call first gen the first generation modelling tool, which only went up to six stars. And it's actually a very, very crude tool compared to what we now use for new builds and for major renovations and what we use for all of our retrofit work. So the second generation tool is way more sophisticated than that first gen tool. It was a great idea 20 plus years ago when we introduced it and put it in our legislation and now it's stuck there for the moment. So a lot of the houses that are getting zero and one star, a lot of them probably deserve zero and one star, but there are some of them, if they've got good orientation, that are more like two and three star, that you might not see. The, the other point is that if somebody was to take this house and demolish it and build yes. something new, yes. they're writing off $200,000 of absolutely. value before they've even laid a new concrete slab. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, clearly you could have gone and got a Rawson home, four bed, two bathroom, 200 square metre house, taken up all the yard, um, ended up paying twice as much as they paid here, because you do end up paying twice as much, don't believe those base prices they tell you, um, and it would have been six star. So a much bigger six-star house would use four times as much energy as this house. So, yeah, massive. And their quality of life um, is hugely improved. In fact, I think I've got a... Oh, yeah, I've got a page here. So, you know, it's not, it's not a fancy house. They ran out of money to do... We've got planned a nice step down to a front courtyard and a rear deck mm -hmm. and a carport out to the side. Everyone's budget runs out. Those things have been designed. They'll be implemented gradually over the next few years. They've got a whole new roof, um, and they're incredibly happy. Can, can I ask, if they were going to do underfloor insulation, how would they do that? <laughs> find some small people. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it makes a big difference if you can find some insulators who know what they're doing. You've got a keen small person who's not afraid of dark, horrible, cramped spaces. Um, I had mine done, and I didn't have a big 
space, um, but it is hard to find people willing to do it. Yeah. Systems which have quite thick um, frames and things, these are much finer. As I said, don't come in the fancy mechanisms, but I'm incredibly impressed by how well they perform. So they're about two thirds the price of the tilt and turns, and surprisingly airtight for a sliding mechanism. Um, so well worth looking at. Uh, detail of the kitchen uh, and the bathroom. Again, another example where we reduced um, some existing glazing, so we infilled. Um, so that we didn't cop too much of that westerly sun, but we got some, some of that nice northwesterly in winter, particularly from the trees. Here's the um, this is the really early EER modelling. It's fit around the other way, the north is up here. Um, so this is with the uh, subfloor insulation, it was getting to 7.1 stars um, without it, it's at 6.8. We use ceiling fans throughout in our houses. Um, uh, external shading um, in a simple, again from Bunnings you can get all sorts of um, external shading devices, even on my previous uh, award, architectural award winning house I just had some shade cloth systems from Bunnings. Um, there are all sorts of clever ways you can make your house perform um, quite cheaply. Did I see a hand up? Cool. Um, some shots during construction, making sure there's lots of insulation in the walls and ceiling. Um, so we go out and do visual so inspection. Did, sorry, what do you use there as that insulation? That's the um, the canal. What's it called? Earth wall. Earth wall. That's it. I was going to say wall surface. But it's not wall. It's part of the oh no, no, it's no, not. It's <laughs> no, so it's not wall. So don't be tricky. But that's its name. So <laughs> did you actually take the um, the, the inside off? To yes. The yes. Believe me, when you move that many rooms, all the internal lining. So all the um, we kept was the external cladding, which is the bricks, except in spaces where we reduced the glazing area and created a bit more wall. And we kept the roof frame, we kept the wall frames, we kept the floor, timber floor, but um, all the internal lining was stripped out, so the ceilings and walls were all relined. And there was a new roof as well. Jenny, can I just ask, did you just use this, or did you use this other insulation in between this? I don't know, it's just like a flat roll. No, just this. Yeah, that's so okay. again, you can, if you're really into a passive house approach and you want to make sure you get rid of all your thermal bridging, you can do those things. My experience over the last 10 or 12 years is that, again, do those things if you've got the budget to do them, and that's fine. And in terms of thermal bang for buck and working with clients with tight budgets, it doesn't stack up. Okay. So, um, no, just this. We then check at the end of construction with the thermal camera and the builders we work with know that we will make them pull up roof sheets. We'll get up in the roof space and um, make sure any gaps are filled. In this case, there weren't any. Um, and one of the things that we do to reduce the number of gaps is we, we, um, we don't specify a lot of downlights. If we do specify a downlight, everyone's familiar now that you've got the airtight LED downlights. They're all readily available, which you can insulate over. But we just minimise the number of penetrations through the ceiling. So we combine a ceiling fan and a light. Or we have some wall-mounted permit lighting. There's all sorts of clever ways you can not put holes in your roof. Because mm -hmm. holes in your roof cost you a lot of money in Canberra in winter. We did the blower door test and to my amazement, 2.6 air changes per hour at 50 mm -hmm. pascals. By far the tightest renovation we've ever done. But keep in mind, it's a really simple shape. It is a rectangle, so if you're going to get a really good result on a Renault, it will be a rectangle. Mm. Um, but it still surprised me. So at that level of air tightness, the clients or the residents actually have to be quite conscious of really managing their moisture. So um, mm. making sure they run the exhaust fan or leave a um, window slightly ajar. The great thing about once you've retrofitted your house, um, it is comfortable so much more of the year, but you do have windows open and you remain comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you use that natural natural cross ventilation <coughs> when it's not smoky. Mm -hmm. But even in the cooler months you often will have windows open. There's only about three weeks of the year that I close my bedroom window because we simply warm up mm -hmm. the bedroom too much. 
Just, uh, I've, you may have explained this before, but uh, correct me if I, you have, but uh, the, the floor, Yes. What, was there a, a vapour seal under the board? No. Oh. So were they corked in some way or? Um, we laid a, uh, a floor over the top. Right. We made sure the junction of okay. the floor and the so wall. So the floor is actually a replacement floor. Yes. Right. So, well, right. the, ex the, yeah, the existing timber floor with a new floor, new over, floor the top, over the top. Right. New flooring over the top. Okay. And with particular attention to the wall and floor junction, that's where most right. of the leakage happens. Their floor is actually surprisingly top. good I mean, anyway. That, that's but, remarkable, really, yeah. when you consider that that's done with floorboards. Yes. Mm. Um, well, it was one of those um, plasticky woods. Right. Um, that I wouldn't call floorboards, but which really mm. quite cost effective. It's the first time we'd used it, I can't think of the name of it, obviously. Mm. Looks really good. Incredibly surprised how good it looks. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> when you're doing your floor, is there any accessories that you use to seal the edges? Um, or do you have to make your own? No, these buttings, we've got it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, just get, invest in a good corking gun. If you ever buy a corking gun, don't be tempted by the $5 ones. You'll regret it. You'll get RSI very quickly. Um, don't pay anything less than $20. In fact, I would encourage you to get a $40 one. Um, so it's just having a good corking gun and the right gap filler. And that's where Renew did a fabulous article last year outlining all the different types of corking agents and where you would use the different ones. It's a great article. But if you have a big hole because it's going from ground to... To, to rectangular, is there some sort of skirting thing that you can add there? There are all, depends on the hole, depends where it is, but yes, you wouldn't just <coughs> rely on a corking agent in that case. If you've got a big hole, you'd infill with something, um, whether it's... My friend has a pole hole. Ah. And he wants to put in a, a, a new floor. Okay. And I was just wondering how you'd see it around the floor. Um, there are th this tubular gap filler rod. Mm -hmm. I find very satisfying. Anyone played with gap filler rod? Yeah. Big gaps. <laughs> <laughs> Squeezing it in before you cork over the top. Um, and that comes in all sorts of sizes from really quite big down to quite narrow. So it saves the amount of cork agent you use. What about using tape? In many yes, cases? that's right. Mm. Yeah, tape. Um, yes. You can use all sorts of tape. And um, the tapes now that are available from Pro Climber and from CSR Bradford, particularly the tapes they use on their... Um, Vapor permeable wraps they use for houses are great. <coughs> they stick really well. They yeah, can be used um, really effectively. For, um, you could probably vapor use vapor. collars as well. That uh, plumbing, yeah. uh, plumbing fittings that go through roofs, they make the, uh, the rather collars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Deck tights. Yeah. Or you can make your own. Or you can make your yeah. own. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. Or blue tack. You know? Yeah. And it's not obviously on big gaps because I'm big gas. But I've helped, again, in rental houses that they've used blue tack. Have you sticky tape, you know, you name it. it. Just make sure you don't have those direct holes to outside and you take them down. Um, there's a nice quote from the clients. This is actually part of a presentation that the lead architect's giving tomorrow morning. The architecture award presentations are happening at the moment, presenting to the jury. So this is part of what we're proceeding with them. So the clients are incredibly happy. We like this... Um, She's got an incredibly space efficient little battery tucks around the corner, and she is so proud of it. It's so exciting. In fact, they're all very proud and excited uh, about it, and they like to show us each time we go in to see them how well their pantry's working. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a reminder what it was like before for the old kitchen connecting to a pokey dining room. Instead, we've got this lovely space that connects to outside and soaks up the sun. The kids' bedrooms have been vastly improved. From the outside, you can still tell that it was a, you know, it's an original Kayleen house. It's had a little bit of a facelift, um, but it certainly looks better than it did. And the kitchen is certainly um, much, much nicer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I forgot to have a quote. Um, so what did you do with the roof? Did, was it tiled and you replaced it? Yeah. Like so for life? No, we put a metal the, roof on. Yeah. Yeah, so, and... Um, yeah, it was a tile roof that was needed yeah. Why did you need to change the roof? Oh, there were some issues with it structurally. It needed a bit of repair and the tiles were quite broken. Um, we, don't, we don't always replace roofs. It's certainly a, it's a big cost saving. You're talking 30 to 40 grand on a little house like this for a new colour bond roof. 
Um, so it was something we looked at carefully, but um, working with the builder and inspecting the roof thoroughly at that tender stage, the decision was made, no, this is worth replacing now. So is it decided on value or on a property's efficiency? Nothing to do with efficiency, yeah, no. So if in terms of your ceiling insulation is where it's all at. Um, in terms of uh, efficiency, air tightness and insulation at the ceiling level is the important thing. The only thing you need to be concerned at uh, the roof level is potentially moisture management. That's a slightly different story. Mm -hmm. You put the metal roof on bigger hats, or uh, um, get more insulation as it goes over the wall plate. Because that's a big failing here in Australia. It is a big failing right. here in Australia. I'm not exactly sure what they did there, but it's something that this builder is particularly. Hats in there, they get with the roof up, so you get the full insulation yeah. right across onto the top. Probably. Line. Yeah. You know, in places like America and Europe, the roof collapses a bit because of the heat loss through that yes. crushed um, mm. low insulation. Yeah. yeah. It's called an ice yeah. stand. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk for a minute? Yep. Yeah. Jenny, about the issue of not only are you reducing the cost of the renovation work and reducing the energy demand by that dwelling and hence its carbon, reduced carbon load, but also you're increasing the value of the house in terms of its real estate yes. into the future. Absolutely. And um, yeah, oh, the, we just judging by the rate at which our phone rings at Lighthouse, there is a inc massively increasing demand for smaller, smarter, sustainable, climate resilient, carbon, um, mm -hmm. healthy homes. Um, people are getting this; they really get it. And um, yeah, I have. They're not going to lose out; they're going to win big time if they ever do sell and move on. Um, People, uh, too many people are still convinced by real estate agents that bigger is better and that more square metreage is what you need. Probably not people in this audience, I'm preaching to the converted. But um, there are enough people in Canberra for um, houses like this to generate a lot of interest. And we've only had three of our um, projects ever sell, and that's in our jigsaw housing to Lighthouse time. Um, and they all sold at 17% above market value, which is way above what they were valued at, um, and hotly contested auctions. Um, and people often contact us saying, are there any for sale? Well, they think we're developers, and we say, sorry, I'm not a developer. Um, so, yes, these places are only going to be in higher yeah. and higher. It'd be interesting to flash up a, you know, the last few years of uh, electricity bill yes. as you're selling it. Yeah. And then they, you know, prospective buyers could then go home and look at theirs and go, oh, gee. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. Did they put solar on the roof? Or? No, no, their budget run out, uh, you know, ran out. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the approach we take too, that if you've got a limited budget, let's reduce the amount of electricity you need. We all know solar's continuing to come down in price. That's they can save up for that and get that later. Maybe they'll even be able to get the battery in a few years' time as well. But um, it's not, um, it's lower on our list. We work on the building and right first. Most of our clients do. And did you suggest a builder or did they find a builder? Or no, or? We, we suggested a builder. Mm -hmm. We've got a group of builders with no financial connection to them, mm -hmm. but they're builders that we know that get what we do. Mm -hmm. And we're increasingly working with more builders because there's a lot of builders who are really interested in this space and are genuinely motivated to do the right thing of course there's plenty who aren't we all hear about them but no we worked with a particular builder Rory Taylor from in-depth building solutions I'm not afraid to say um, is great great at um, small scale remote work and bigger scale remote work um, anything else I'm not sure if that's so you didn't yeah. use permits there, yes, before you recommended permits. Sorry? Permits over the... Yes, they've, they've chosen to go. They went, they got a deal from a friend on their window dressings and they're not great window dressings. Yeah. <laughs> We've chatted about that. Okay. They know they can, <laughs> they can, uh, we know we can improve on what they've got. But again, at the moment they're just so amazed by how much better the house feels compared to what they were used to. But maybe as they spend more time in it, they'll start tweaking things. But what type of permits can you recommend so that they don't look ugly? <laughs> oh, 
cardboard. Okay. Cardboard's your friend. <laughs> Honestly, there are all sorts of, depending on the mechanism, but there are all sorts of clever ways. All you want to do is have something go from the arc across to the, the, the rod on which the, the window dressing hangs. And depending on the mechanism, that can make it a bit trickier. But um, yeah, a piece of cardboard can often do the trick. And that's what the people in Turner, well, no, they actually ended up going with Pellmate. They went for something fancier. But um, yeah, it doesn't have to be, honestly, get your cardboard and your sticky tape out. So you're trying to reduce the air flow? Yes, you want, don't want that warm air at the top to cascade down past the glass, creating mm -hmm. that air movement. This stuff. So I have a question, more of a comment. Um, recently, when there was smoke coming here with these houses, mm -hmm. um, my family in two different properties, we bought an air purifier. And some of the air purifiers, they have um, like a monitoring system yep. inside them where you have an app yep. and it shows you your whole stats for the week or the month Yes. of how um, much particulate was in your air in your room. Yes. And I feel like it's the, a, a new idea that I really like because you can monitor it remotely so if you wanted to check to see how, how your house was doing if you weren't there. You can, you can still get that information. You could do that without an air purifier, and I would encourage you to use something other than the meter in an air purifier. They're not very accurate. I, te I checked out a few you check during the smoke. Out. Yeah. That's why I, I, bought, I bought some for starters for my house and my office, and then I couldn't resist getting the um, Robson Environmental, who were running around Canberra flat chat testing all the government buildings. I got them to drop in and see how the, um, the two uh, purifiers, I had, purifiers that I had running in the office how what they were reading correlated to what the actual reading was, and they were reading low. Um, but they, um, the relative, they moved up and down at the right, you know, rate, but they just were out. Mm. Mm. Chunk. Yeah, you know, if, if you like left a, a window open or something, and you know, yeah. you, you've got a feeling that you're not. But well. there are other data loggers that do that. There's all sorts of cool data loggers out there. We give all of our clients a net at mode. It doesn't do fine particulates. Fine particulates require a particular type of meter, and I've actually bought one of the cheapest ones that is around that Berkeley thinks pretty cool. And it works pretty well. The purple air, did anyone get into in, indoor air quality monitoring? So I've got purple air meters set up inside and outside my office. So Because my office at Fishwick was impacted terribly. The outdoor air quality was the indoor air quality very quickly. And we had some terrible, terrible days. And I'm asthmatic and I've got an asthmatic staff member. And anyway, um, I got very interested in it. But it was really... Um, there's a few things here. There's the data loggers. <coughs> then there's the interesting thing about... Um, I didn't finish the data loggers. Let me finish the data loggers. Net Atmos are a type of tool that you can use to measure temperature, humidity and CO2 levels. Again, but CO2... Some, of the, some things are harder to measure. Temperature and humidity are easy. Um, but getting metres to measure CO2 levels and VOCs and fine particulates getting a good meter, you have to spend quite a bit of money. I haven't spent enough money to have really <coughs> meters in my zero. Um, and there's all sorts of other things. I use little wireless tags that do humidity, temperature, noise, something else, light. So you can tell, no, the net outmode does noise, they do light. Anyway, there's a whole range of things. So an air purifier, Back to the air purifiers, um, they're great. Increasingly, people are going to have them if we have conditions like this last summer. Um, they will be needed because what we quickly discovered was that even airtight houses and even passive house airtight houses, smoke still gets in. And we quickly realised that the quality of filters used in Australia were not up to dealing with smoke. They found this out in big commercial buildings, they found this out in heat recovery ventilation systems in passive houses. I found it out in the heat recovery ventilator pairs. German heat recovery ventilator pairs I had in my house were not able to deal with smoke. So that was a really interesting finding. I can assure you by next summer there will be a whole range of different filters available. Um, and I would imagine people doing clever integrated purifiers and coolers and, and other things. Um, but it was a real change in thinking because previously we had always designed for fantastic cross ventilation over summer and we had relied on Canberra's beautiful air quality 
and we all know it was an incredible shock to not mm -hmm. be able to do that and everyone suffered and got a lot hotter. With the filters, the HEPA filters for the PM 2.5 and the carbon filters for the smoke, so does that mean you need a, a good carbon filter? All the air purifiers have that, but all the air conditioners and heat recovery ventilation systems don't have those good filters. Ah, okay. That was the difference. There's, I've quickly learned there are G3 through to G5 and F7 through to F9. There's all sorts of different types of filters, plus then the carbon filters are different again. Um, there's a whole world of filters out there to get across. Um, and by next summer, all the suppliers will be across that in the next few months, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. But most air conditioners have really very coarse very filters. Very basic. Okay. They're, uh, they're just there to basically take dust. Mm -hmm. The chunks. Quite, quite coarse dust mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, bits of fibre. Yeah. out of the air. Is so there any indication then if they're going to improve it by next season that they'll be able to retrofit better filters? Mm -hmm. I've already got um, some new types of filters for my little HRVs. Mm -hmm. um, not all, it's quite tricky because the, the better quality filters reduce the airflow so they need a stronger fan and so it can be tricky. Yeah. So we won't be able to get top notch filters but better filters than we've currently got. Um, mm. So air, air purifiers will become something you need. So in my house, my house was so much better than the office and so much better than any of my friends' homes, but the smoke still started to get in. So I used an air purifier and I used my split system and without my split system and my air purifier, it would have been a miserable, mm. a miserable summer. I mean, less miserable than summer houses. But, um, Jane, just going back to the model here. Yes. You've obviously, got climate data uh, built into that. Yep. Is that like a 30 year average? Or, yeah. And clearly, that data set's changing, mm. <laughs> particularly in recent times. Is, there, is it possible to update it to. Not at, not at the moment. Order? That's been discussed a lot. Um, it does use the last 30 years average data specific to the climate region, so it uses um, 69 different climate zones across Australia, not the eight climate zones of the National Construction Code, so it's much more specific. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's, that is, a, you could say, a flaw in the system, but again, if you know what you're doing with the tool, you, you look carefully, it breaks it down into cooling load, into heating load, mm. and you can actually run the software, look particularly at a hot week in summer. So you can look at those sustained high 30 temperatures and see how the house is performing during that period. So when we model, you know, you can get an eight-star house that does really great in winter. It's really horrible in summer. Um, it's getting the balance right. Um, so again, knowing how to work with the software. So it's not impossible to make sure you're so you really... can sort of observe the worst case day, yeah, yeah. historical day or... But, um, yeah. We find we spend a lot of time talking about, uh, well, increasingly over the last few years, a lot more time talking about summer performance. Mm. Mm. But I guess the house that previously didn't need any heating or cooling in a handful of years' time probably will. Yeah, <laughs> and that's where the you know, split systems um, have come such, where I mean, they've always been more efficient. But the new um, heat pump, you know, it, Heat pumps uh, or splits, reverse cycle air conditions are by far the most um, efficient way to heat. We tend to think of them as only for cooling in Australia. Now, I installed one in my house last April for heating. Its primary purpose was for heating. It turned out it was a blessing when we had 40 degrees and we couldn't cross ventilate. But I didn't need to use it much. Mainly we relied on ceiling fans. Mm -hmm. um, but what am I saying? So uh, there's an interesting article about my current house where the first winter I had no heating, the second year I had um, two, a 900 watt infrared panel on the ceiling in each living area and then last winter I didn't use those infrared panels, um, I just used one 3.5 kilowatt split system located in one lounge room and had no, oh thank you, I like this more water. Um, and you know I, I understood the science and I knew they were efficient, I guess I had a bit of a mental block against things that blow or, you know, architects hate them because they're things on the wall. Um, I just love mine. It is amazing. Um, they've come such a, such a long way. So easy to control. 
um, hardly notice the noise, hardly notice the movement, and combined with um, ceiling fans on low, it distributes the heat through my house like you wouldn't believe. The bo to show you how well it did, the two teenage boys did not turn the heating on in the bathroom at all. One of the issues with them is that their coefficient of performance uh, falls off quite markedly as temperature rises. So in extreme heat condition, if one a poorly performing house is relying on a split system, yes. uh, as temperatures, maximum yes. temperatures in heat waves rises, yep. uh, those houses will encounter difficulties. Absolutely. So yeah, older, particularly older split systems in poorly performing houses, yes, are going yeah. to struggle. Um, my new system in a new house is going to yeah. I've set up a micro spray to spray water. Fantastic. And it's, well, I'm a retired power engineer, so I, it, it only comes on when the. That's the great. Running. Yep. Yeah. We often uh, we have that put that tip up every summer. On, freezer. Oh, it's for summertime, that one. Uh, but the whole day? Or what time no, it's only when the, uh, the connects or the fan, the outdoor fan is running. Yeah. It flips a switch. And that Brilliant. switch does a solenoid which does the water to, to the microspray. Wow. Is it inside? Very cool. No, it's, oh, it's the outside. Yeah. 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 What was the approach for the... <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back. Yep, yep. Just going to ask, what was the approach for heating and cooling in the two houses in front today? In this one, we turn in the... We'll go back to the Turner one. They already had a split system in the extension. Um, but they admitted they hadn't cleaned the filters off mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So they're quite amazed how effectively that now works, now that they've cleaned <laughs> the filters. They, they did have a wood heater as well. Um, I can't wait for them to go through this winter because I don't think they'll use the wood heater. I think they'll use the mm -hmm. split system that's now had its filters cleaned and then, you know, the room improved, I think, will just work beautifully. Um, in the front rooms, I think they just... I think they've got oil... Oil, column oil heaters that they move around with the double brick now insulated and because it does soak up a lot of lovely morning sun those rooms are going to be a lot more comfortable so they'll require very little sorry I'm just remembering the question was wrong um, very little additional heating so we haven't haven't retrofitted any heating and cooling they're waiting waiting to see how it goes and that's something I recommend to a lot of people is you'll be amazed how much better the house will perform go through the seasons and, and see how comfy um, it is. Often an electric blanket is enough you need in a bedroom. Okay. Um, we've got a 1970s brick veneer townhouse in built on it. Yep. Um, built, on, built on timber, not on the slab. And I think it's raking with the uh, one when we bought it. And we, we're trying to upgrade it. But one thing I'm thinking of in the future is to blow an insulation into the into the cavities. Yep. Is that something you suggest or recommend? Yes. Yeah. So when we when we're not in this case because we took all the internal plasterboard yeah. down and put yeah. the bats in, yeah. but oftentimes we don't. We don't take off all the lining and move all the walls unless we really have to, um, or we think it's worthwhile. So yes, we do. We I use a lot of the a product called Insure Block, which is recycled polystyrene cubes. Um, I tested it on several houses before I. Um, including my own, it flows in really well and it interlocks and it's quite stable. Um, but there are other um, blow-in options. Alexander Watson has got a new product, Superfill, I think it's called. Um, it's worth, I, I think it's worth doing. I find the fibrous products tend to catch on the mortar dags on the back of the bricks and on the studs and noggins. So you may not end up with full coverage. I find the initial block gives better coverage. I've got no link to the business. They're based in Gosford, but they do come to Canberra. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to be careful. You ever take a PowerPoint off the wall, fill cubes of polystyrene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> flow into the room. Yeah. I'd be interested in your comment on this. Um, I, 45 years ago, bought an old Gubby house and um, been fiddling around with it for the last 45 years. <coughs> At some stage last year, I thought I'll put another layer of uh, bats on top of the bats that I'd already put in yeah. 30 years ago on top of rock wall, which was there when I bought the house. So I went up to Alexander Watson and said, well, how about this? And they said, oh, no, not a good idea. We'll take all the insulation out and start again. Yes. The reason is that um, if you have rock wall around the wiring and then you over-insulate that, you need to look at the um, 
capacity of the wire to handle the loads. So you may need to rationalise it on to You have to do that service. regardless. So when I, <laughs> um, I'd say you don't have to take out the rock wall. Um, unless it's really messy and there's lots of lots of possum crap and leaves and rats and mice and stuff. Um, it's a really important point talking about retrofitting wall insulation. As soon as you retrofit wall insulation, you have to um, really you have to get a licensed electrician um, to derate things because you are going to be overheating the, the cabling and things. So there's things that need to be factored in. So yes, that is true of the ceiling, but it could have been managed. It just would have been a little bit of an electrical cost. 